Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 13-game main slate that we have here on Friday, uh, May 12th. A uh, lot of games to get to, a lot of arms here, but really a bunch of kind of underwhelming spots so far, I think. Um, do have a couple of guys... Uh, I got a couple of openers that we can mostly just breeze through. Um, one or two other guys that are making, well, notably, Paxton is back uh, for Boston, making his first start of the season. Um, and another couple of, I guess, on the other side of this game, Wainwright making his second start of the year, JP France making his second start, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but we've got everybody announced outside of an official starter here in the Mets game uh, against Washington. By most accounts, it's going to be Tyler McGill. Uh, he did, I think he's on a full six days rest here, and um, Mets aren't quite certain what they want to do. They just haven't officially announced him. Uh, but it would be him as opposed to like a Joey Lucchese or something like that. Uh, I think that's kind of where they would be in the rotation. But no official announcement yet from there. But outside of that, that's really the only question mark we've got on the mound. Uh, we'll go over things a little bit more when we get into each one of the games. Um, that said, we do have initial projections loaded on the site. Um, it is a Strider and a, a Garrett Cole day. So we're seeing, I mean, these guys are, are 2,000 plus more expensive than everybody else on the day. Uh, the next highest arm is Sonny Gray. Um and the four guys at the top, Corbin Burns, Gray, Cole, and Strider, all seeing the bulk of the ownership come in so far. And I think this really makes sense in my first look of, over the slate. Uh, really not too much to get super thrilled about um, in in the rest. Uh, and that's kind of strange for a big 13-game slate. A lot of the time we've got a, a ton of arms that we could really want to get to in tournaments. Maybe not so much today. Still some red numbers down here at the bottom. Bunch of guys that we could just mostly cross off our our pools um, and X out of our pools, I, I suppose. And that's pretty much what we're going to be doing. So let's uh, let's dispense with the pleasantries and just get into the games, huh? So we'll start with uh, Tampa and New York. Uh, Trevor Kelly is one of the openers. Um, he is only going to go about an inning or so, so we're not going to be playing him. And it's likely going to be a Josh Fleming coming in behind. Uh, but who knows uh, what, the, what the Rays are going to do. They've pulled this a couple of times this year where they just bring in somebody somebody else right after that. It really just dictates uh, matchups and, and whatever Kevin Cash wants to do down there. So um, in any case, in either case, whether it's uh, Fleming coming in, as a lefty against uh, the Yankees at Yankee Stadium, uh, we're not doing that, uh, and we're certainly not going to be playing Kelly for no, zero upside. So, um, can you get to some Yankees? Yeah, sure. I think uh, you could probably get to the point where you can start playing the Yankees nearly every day against um, most arms in baseball, including bullpen games, and, and definitely a Josh Fleming who doesn't really have a lot of strikeout stuff himself. Um, because they're getting a little bit healthier now. Uh, Harrison Bader and Aaron Judge both solidifying their presence from the right side of the plate uh, pretty well. Um, Volpe has been pretty good this season overall. DJ still at a playable price in the middle of the lineup, 4,000 flat. Glaber getting up there at 53. Rizzo still at a 47. So you can, uh, you can stack the Yankees as you can pretty much always uh, at Yankee Stadium. Plenty of power here, and there'll be a, a fine tournament stack for you. Um, so far, coming in pretty far down the spectrum, I would say, um, in terms of value, and that's because of a couple of these these guys, like a Rizzo, like a Judge, of course, and a Glaber are a little bit on the pricier end. And on a full 13-game slate, kind of hard to get to, especially if you want to play like a Garrett Cole or somebody on the mound. 12000 for him. He's getting Tampa here once again. And in back-to-back -back starts, right? And they really, in his last start, it was kind of his first uh, real subpar outing of the of the season. Uh, they got to him a little bit. I mean, he still went five innings, struck out 
six or something. Um, but he did give up five runs. So the control is, is basically static with Cole. Um, he's still walking anywhere from one to two guys a game. Nothing terribly worrisome there. Uh, nothing worrisome in the in the arsenal either for Cole. But it's just a lineup construction and a price tag deal. And the fact that he gets the best team in baseball over here. So um, now we do have to keep an eye on Tampa as to whether they will have Wander Franco in the lineup. He came out of the game yesterday, tweaked his neck a little bit, uh, seemed to be mostly precautionary as he stayed in the game for a little while, but uh, they ended up pulling him just to kind of be safe. They may give him a day off here, but it doesn't really matter. They've got uh, Taylor Walls in the middle of the lineup who will play some shortstop, uh, and then Isak Paredes, who they can move over to third base. They've got a lot of positional flexibility here uh, in the infield. So um, nothing really worrisome there. And every single one of these guys, they can just kind of plug and play. And their offense doesn't really miss a beat. This is Garrett Cole. And this is at Yankee Stadium. So um, if I had to choose between he and Strider, I'd, I'd rather just get to Strider. Um, I think the matchup is a little bit better here for him against Toronto rather than Cole against uh, Tampa. Uh, but both of these guys, like they're they're the top two arms uh, in terms of raw upside, of course. But you, you know, price adjusted now, like you, you got to pay for them. So um, we're still seeing the big heavy ownerships on them and big projections naturally. Uh, so none of that is really changed. Uh, it's just some pretty bad matchups, and this is a full 13 game slate. You don't have to go here and and eat full. 30 or 40 percent or whatever it is on these on these guys up here 12,000 12,000 um and when we're talking like it's not that we're starving for value necessarily on such a huge slate we can always find value uh to get to these guys it uh, but they're in very bad matchups and you're paying top tier price tags for them so uh just that's really the only stuff we got to keep in mind there um but we can get to the yankees if you want to run some like correlated Garrett Cole stacks. I think that's fine. Uh, okay, let's move on. Mets and the Nationals. As I mentioned, it's probably going to be Tyler McGill, He'll no, McGill here. No official announcement just yet, but he's been pretty poor all season. Um, they demoted him, as a matter of fact. and Or no, that was David Peterson. They moved McGill to the bullpen. They'd like to move him to the bullpen because he's, he's really just been awful. Um, been getting picked apart in his last several starts in, in plus matchups. Rockies got to him a little bit. Um, and I forget his his couple matchups before, prior to that. But um, Mets starting rotation struggling a little bit here. They've been overall pretty underwhelming, sitting two games under 500 right now. And they get kind of a difficult matchup in Mackenzie Gore over here today. Uh, so offensively for the Mets, their price tags have come down precipitously, which is nice. Uh, Nimmo still at 45, but Starling Marte just at 44 now. That's a much more playable price tag. Frankie at 48 and Pete Alonso at 54 are still expensive, as they really kind of should be pretty much every day. But you've got the, the guys down at the bottom half of the lineup um, really not offering all that much upside. Tommy Pham, Jeff McNeil, Mark Khanna, Eddie Escobar, they, they can all make those Met stacks cheaper. Do we want to stack against Mackenzie Gore? Probably not. Do we want to stack Washington against Tyler McGill? Well, maybe. Um, very sticky lineup over here, and despite the fact that they don't hit for any power, just a uh, an 096 ISO here in the early going. Very hard to make this happen on a full 13 game slate, but they don't strike out. They get on base. They can be a little bit sticky here. So. Um, could this be one of the arms that we that we get to? Begill, I I don't think so. Uh, at eight thousand, the the results number one have been and have been really terrible all season. Uh, still throwing fifty five percent of the four seamer here, and and about fifteen percent of the change, twenty percent of the slider. You know, so nothing really has changed in the arsenal. Value wise, however, fastball has been getting picked to, picked apart pretty good. It's just a league average fastball as it is. So he's been on the downside of the variance there for sure here in the early going. Um, changeup still yielding a lot of negative value for him. Slider has been his one real plus pitch, and that's how he's been surviving and really not putting up numbers like uh, a David Peterson type numbers or anything like that. But 
um, at just 20% of the arsenal here, he's struggling to uh, to really establish in counts and be able to get to the slider and work to uh, a, a plus pitch here. But he's got a bad changeup, and that's going to make him really susceptible to the left side of the plate. Um, so without raw whiff stuff from McGill, uh, I think you could consider some one-off pieces of the Nationals over here. Um, you can play a Luis Garcia for sure. He's been excellent this year. His price has come up now, up to about 3300 And But Joey Manessis from the right side of the plate, that's fine. At 2700 uh, that's definitely the plus side of McGill's split in terms of raw whiff stuff because of the slider. So I'd most likely like to stay off of some of the righties here and, and prefer to get to some of the lefties and attack this bad changeup value and really marginal four-seamer. Um that's how I would like to attack if I were going to do it. Um, unfortunately, Capert Ruiz behind the plate really just doesn't have a lot of upside himself. He's got a little bit of pop, and he's 3,000 at a catcher hitting in the three-hole. So sure, if you want to run a Luis Garcia, Capert Ruiz, um, sort of short stack maybe, if you want to get to a super cheap like C.J. Abrams or something at shortstop, uh, I think that could be an interesting little three-man here, but... Very little upside. Um, it's It would just allow you... It's just a price play, and it would allow you to get to the expensive guys up top. Um, Gore on the mound, he's been fantastic. 8,700 for him. Really had kind of a breakout season here, and he's been good in pretty much all but one start. Uh, and that was two starts ago when he got the Cubs, and they got to him a little bit. Um, elevated pitch count, or maybe it was some weather in that game. I forget, but he only went four innings. Struck out four, did give up four runs. So um, probably a combination of the elevated pitch count and the production allowed. So um, Bryce Tag has come up, 8,700. It's it's a difficult spot, of course, against the Mets. They're still not striking out a lot. A 21% aggregate strikeout rate here, but just average in literally every other metric. So they're an attackable list in terms of uh, – run suppression, right? And given Mackenzie Gore's kind of breakout season here, I think fundamentally this could be okay. Um, however, I, I still just generally don't like attacking the Mets. Uh, there's not a lot of raw upside, but he did pick apart this team three starts ago, went six innings and struck out 10. So um, in, in these scenarios, when a, a team is seeing – a starter for the second time of the season. I usually side with the offense, um, but you know you can consider landing on if you if you land on a Mackenzie Gore here uh, in a couple of your teams. If you're just building, I don't think it's bad. I, I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to x him out of the pool. Um, the the stuff has been good. Still throwing the four seamer here, full sixty percent. No changeup usage pretty much at all now, down to you know a tick, tick and a half or so in the change. So he's mostly eliminated that completely, and he's just a four-seamer slider curveball guy. Usage here is pretty much static. Um, Value-wise, the, the breaking pitches have, re have really been good for him. Uh, slider's been good, curveball's been good, and, and the fastball, he's establishing early in counts, still throws a good bit of strike one. Um, but the, the breaking pitches have been equitable. He's, he's got the walk problem, but he's really kind of toned that down. Uh, a couple of starts, it's ballooned a little bit this season, four walks, four walks in a couple, uh, or three, I suppose. But for the most part, he's, he's getting that under control and, it, and it's nowhere near this 12% here as well under 10. So, uh, I think we're seeing a, a breakout for Mackenzie Gore. And if he can establish with the four-seamer slider curveball mix, um, and then perhaps at a later date add back in the change, then he could really realize a lot of the prospect upside um, that he has enjoyed as a, a young player here. So if you land on this at 87, it's not horrific. I'm not going to go out of my way to play it, though, at 87. I think he is probably a bit too expensive for this price. He's a fine tournament pivot, though, if you want to drop down a little bit off of or you can't quite get to a Corbin Burns at 92. Uh, I think this is a playable spot, even though we generally don't like going after the Mets. Okay, Pittsburgh and Baltimore. Uh, interesting game here. Yohan Oviedo has fallen off a cliff compared to his last or his early season successes. Uh, his last three starts have been absolutely horrendous. Uh, five and a third gave up four. Two and a third gave up seven against Washington. 
and five innings gave up six against Toronto in his last start. Uh, the strikeout stuff has totally disappeared, and the slider value that we saw and exploited in a couple outings against White Sox, St. Louis, and Colorado has has totally disappeared here. So uh, four-seamer is still bad value, and now the slider is actually yielding negative value. The curveball for him, um, still at a full 20% usage, has really been his only plus pitch so far. But uh, the four-seamer and the slider that have really allowed him to uh, maneuver a little bit more, um, that that, that value is totally gone. Change up, once you get, like, doesn't throw it a whole hell of a lot, just kind of a show-me change at about 4%, that's yielding value to the field as well. So, um, they're really kind of suspect here, and he should be down this cheap at 6,300. He's... At least he's not at 82 against Washington, like uh, or like he was against Washington. Um, but that said, even at 63, I'm not sure we want to be going after Baltimore here against right-handed pitching this season. 22% aggregate K rate, pretty average there as well. Uh, but it's still a very dangerous offense. I think this is an interesting spot given how um, the arsenal value is trending for Oviedo to get to some Baltimore. They're just kind of coming in middling in in value and ownership, very low in the ownership spectrum so far. And I think there are some cheaper pieces that allow you to get to some of the more expensive guys. Cedric at 51 is far playable than the 6,000 he's he's been at um, at some points in the season. Rutch is coming down a little bit at 48. That's playable still. Santander from both sides of the plate, he's still just 4,000. Mountcastle now at 46, also playable. Gunner down at 36. Uh, so you can attack some of the negative four-seamer value here, I think, with some Baltimore. It's a pretty off-the-board tournament stack. Uh, we know that they have a lot of upside, and the prices are much more uh, palatable now. They'll allow you to get to some some pretty balanced teams and some balanced arms up top if you'd like to get there. 6,600 on the mound for Kyle Bradish. I mean, it's just so rare that I end up playing Kyle Bradish. He's kind of enigmatic here. Um, but really, the arsenal is not very good. Uh, pretty much across the board, um, the, he's at about 34% of the cutter now. He's dropped the usage down a little bit, increased the sinker usage to about 15%. So balancing out the fastball arsenal a little bit, uh, which is encouraging. That's generally what we like to see. But um, and, and flattening out, I guess, the breaking pitch arsenal a little bit as well. Not as heavy on the slider usage and moved a little bit over to the curveball. Um, Changeup still at about 10-12%, give or take. So he's flattening out the, the pitch mix usage, and that's really what makes him uh, serviceable in, in some outings. However, the cutter value is giving up about two outs to the field still, so that's still bad. Sinker value been getting blasted, so he's throwing it... Uh, you know, about three times as much now relative to what we display here in the sheet. And he's <laughs> naturally seeing uh, about double um, the negative value in this. So I'm giving up three, uh, about three outs to the field here. Um, change up bad too. So really in spreading out the arsenal here, um, he may be uh, confusing himself a little bit and not... Um, not just focusing on, on the good pitches that really give him a lot of value. Uh, I'm really not sure why we wanted to be throwing the sinker more um, when, it, when it was just a bad pitch anyway. So that makes him a little difficult to want to go out of our way to target on the mound. 12% ownership kind of seems a little bit aggressive, but he's one of these guys down here in this range. I mean, you might just kind of land on it because there's kind of nobody else. At 6,600, I think the price tag is okay. Pittsburgh's been very cold over the last couple of weeks. They have cooled off significantly. However, they still got uh, plenty of good veteran hitters up here at the top of the lineup. Brian Reynolds, Andrew McCutcheon, Carlos Santana in particular. Connor Joe doesn't strike out a lot. High contact hitter. Jack Sawinski makes a lot of hard contact against righties. Um... And Cabrian Hayes, this is an interesting batted ball matchup for him because Kyle Bradish gives up a, more power to the right side. So his slider this season, uh, Bradish, really has been his only good pitch. So he can still neutralize some guys from the right side of the plate. Um, and that would tilt me on to some Brian Reynolds, Jack Sawinski type plays, maybe a Jiwon Bay down at the bottom of the lineup. Um, 
so not really thrilled about going to either side of this game. Ryan Reynolds, 5,700. You got to pay for that, you know, and on a full 13 gamer, that makes it kind of difficult um, in a, what is now a pitcher's ballpark. So not super excited about playing a lot of Pittsburgh here. I think you could get to some shorter stacks. It's a fine batted ball matchup for a, an Andrew McCutcheon uh, or even a Cabrian Hayes, something like that. If you want to run short stacks, add in a Sawinski or even a Brian Reynolds, it's, it's not bad. Uh, because Kyle Bradish really not going to blow it by anybody with all that much regularity. So he'll give up some power to the right side, and he still has some control issues and strike one issues to the left side of the plate for sure. So with bad fastball mix here and real negative value on the change and the curveball, uh, he's really kind of only working with one pitch of the five-pitch mix here. And, um, you know, that makes him susceptible. So I'm not super thrilled about targeting him on the mound. If you land on him, yeah, okay, just because Pittsburgh's been very, very cold. Um, but I think you could maybe consider some sneaky offense in this game, really from both sides. Uh, nobody's going to be playing pretty much anybody here, and uh, I think that's uh, an interesting way to go in tournaments. Okay, Atlanta and Toronto. Spencer Strider on the mound, uh, similar to Garrett Cole. We don't have any problems here in the arsenal. Um, no suppression issues or anything like that. Uh, like He only has two good pitches, but they're really, really good pitches. Uh, he's throwing the change up full 5% here, and it's been excellent. Uh, really wish he'd throw this more. He, he just hasn't needed to. Um, when he, I, I'm going to say this every time he's on the mound, when he fully develops out this change and he's throwing it a, a good 15, 20% of the time, I mean, this guy's going to be completely unhittable. Uh, you will see seven inning outings out of him pretty much exclusively. And early in his career here, that's really the only drawback He's got such good K stuff. He goes deep into counts. And very occasionally, the control can kind of uh, spray a little bit. So that's what we're worried about with Strider, especially when we're paying a full 12-2 for him now. We're not getting him at 8K like we were at the beginning of the season. Um, he, it's, it's just that he hasn't gone more than six, six innings or more in all but uh, three starts this season, three of his seven. So... Now, he has the upside if the control is is there for him. Now, Toronto is going to be a little bit more patient. I really like this spot for Strider regardless because the slider is fantastic, and we're kind of back into old Toronto Blue Jays days where they just cannot hit a breaking pitch to save their life. Um, so I I love getting to Strider here if we can make it happen price-wise. It's just line of construction. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with... Uh, Eating 25% ownership, even on a guy that's 12,000, even on a full 13 game slate, which I generally don't like doing. Um, this is a below average matchup, but Spencer Strider is a well above average uh, DFS pitcher here. So uh, I've got no problems getting to him. Uh, I really like the upside for the slider here. I wouldn't be surprised if he strikes out 10 once again here against Blue Jays, even though against righties. They're only striking out about a, an average clip, or a little bit better than average here, at just 22% so far this season, making hard contact. Um, but that's not really an issue. Strider's only problem with hard contact, if you want to call it a problem, is a little bit to the left side of the plate, but he's got a 36% K rate to that side anyway. Uh, and the only guys there that are were really... Well, really, I guess the only guys there from the left side of the plate, Dalton Varsho, Kevin Kiermeyer. Kevin Biggio, Brandon Belt, and they're all going to strike out a truckload in this matchup. So um, I think this is perfectly reasonable to get to Strider, and I don't particularly care that it's Toronto. I'll play him basically against everybody in baseball. It, it doesn't matter. Um, Bassett on the mound for the Blue Jays, 8,200 for him. This is a really kind of a difficult spot for him. Um, it's an interesting price tag, and if you land on this kind of in the mid-range, he may be one of the guys that I would kind of like to get to. He's a fine pivot off of like a Martin Perez, who will be a bit more popular against Oakland. We'll get to that later. Um, but, I mean, this is a much worse matchup, of course, uh, against Atlanta. I mean, well, let me let me sort of backtrack that a little bit. It's basically an, an equal matchup. Atlanta against righties this season, they're striking out and, and producing at roughly the same clip as Oakland is against lefties. Um, now, I, as far as like who I respect more, I, I think it's probably Martin Perez on the mound. Um, 
but I think Bassett is a first, perfectly serviceable arm as well. Unfortunately, when we go after the Braves here, we really need guys that have really, really good whiff stuff. And Bassett just doesn't have it in aggregate. Not a lot has changed here in the arsenal for him this season. Um, let's see, where is he change-wise? Uh, yeah, still just you know 10% or so of the four-seamer. 35, he's ticked up the, the two-seamer a little bit. He's come down a little bit on the cutter usage, so just kind of flattening out. Nothing really um, all that interesting to speak of. Still throwing the change, 6 8%, slider 16 18%, you know, things like this. So mostly static here value-wise. Um, there's really only been, I guess the sinker-slider combo has uh, really been most equitable for him. The sinker's always been, the two-seamer's always been his best pitch, Bassett's. Um, so eking a little bit more value out of the slider now, which is encouraging. It'll make him more serviceable against the right side of the plate, but... Uh, with the lack of a changeup and still throwing the sinker a lot to the left side, it's it'll make him a little susceptible there. So, um, you know, no matter how you slice it, I think I'd probably still side with uh, Martin Perez. We'll go over that a little bit more. But um, a dangerous spot here. If you land on this at very low ownership, I think I'd probably be okay with running it. Um, 8,200 is okay. And, it, you know, it's not 9,200 like we've had to pay for Bassett. Um, at some points here. Now, they're still going to make a lot of hard contact and hit for some power here, and they'll walk. So this is a very difficult spot, uh, and I wouldn't go out of my way to play some Bassett on the mound, but also don't think I'm going to go out of my way to play Braves. It's a it's a fine spot to target some Acuna, really good spot for him, I think, uh, and, and fine to play a Matt Olson uh, up at the top of the lineup. They're expensive, though. you got to pay for these guys. You're paying the same prices. against an above-average arm here, and... I mean, they're still in a hitter's ballpark. So uh, if you need to get to a, a three-man or something like that, you can still play Eddie. He's still just 2,800. Um, not so, not the greatest two-seamer hitter, but uh, he, it's fine. Um, you can play some Michael Harris down at the bottom of the lineup if you'd like to as well. Or an Ozzy Albies, it's okay. But uh, overall, just kind of lukewarm on the Braves. Also, just kind of falling right in the middle in terms of value um and and ownership here so far so i mean no toronto for me i'm not doing anything with them and maybe a couple basset teams if you land on that good bit of strider if you can make this happen but um kind of lukewarm on on atlanta's offense in that particular spot okay let's move on angels in cleveland uh tyler anderson 5500 man this, this we've gotten a full 40 percent price drop on tyler anderson now compared to where he was at the beginning of the season and this is where we want to <laughs> really go after Tyler Anderson because he's still got really good suppression metrics. Unfortunately for him, it's just so difficult to make up any um, any points in terms of strikeouts if he gives up any production whatsoever. And he pitches to a lot of contact and he just doesn't strike anybody out. He induces a lot of soft contact, right? So if he's on the plus side of the variance here, I mean, he could blast through Cleveland. They have been horrific all season. This is just a super, super poor offense. Buck 12 ISO, 274 Woba, 25% hard contact rate with an 18% soft. So he's going to be able to induce a lot of soft contact in this spot. I mean, they're just awful top to bottom, striking out really a little bit more against lefties than they do against righties, but three ticks more, as a matter of fact. So they're much more attackable with left-handers than they are with right-handers. And we've seen what Eddie Rodriguez, for example, has done to them in back-to-back -back starts. He's just torn them apart. So um, I think you could go after a little bit of Cleveland here. I generally do not like doing it, uh, but I don't want to play them, you know. And I would much rather just side with a Tyler Anderson here at a super cheap price tag, 5500 Like, he has upside here for 20 and 25 points, I think. Um, now really what we're worried about, of course, is the, is the strikeout stuff and being able to make up, uh, any production that he could give up because there's still a, a little bit of a sticky team over here. Um, even though they are bad, the guardians. So we're, we're a little bit worried also with, uh, with some run support because they get the angels, Logan Allen on the other side, 7,800 on the mound for him. 
I love this kid. Of the prospects that have come up and debuted this season, uh, I think he, along with Tanner Bybee and probably Bryce Miller, they've got the highest upside of the three, uh, or of the the six, you know, rookies that we've really been excited, including like a Grayson uh, Rodriguez and Mason Miller and, you know, a couple of these other guys. Logan Allen is right up there with uh, with with top tier pitching prospects in baseball. And Cleveland has always been able to develop pitching. It's just unfortunate that they, get, that they can't develop any offense. Um, so 7,800, unfortunately, the Angels this season have been far, far better against lefties than they have against righties. 115 WRC+, plus, 19% strikeout rate, 340 Woba, 35% hard contact. Not hitting for a bunch of power just yet, but um, you know, as soon as these guys sort of get into the middle of the summer here and everybody kind of starts clicking Taylor Ward at the top of the lineup, Anthony Rendon in the middle, Brandon Drury, Mike Trout, of course, um, these righties here, they have a lot of upside and they can make it very difficult. Hunter Renfro, uh, on, on some of these lefties. So I'm not super enthused about playing Logan Allen at what's a little bit of an elevated price tag for a very young arm here. Uh, however, I love the stuff. Um, all of this is very, very encouraging. He's not throwing this cutter a lot, and it's kind of a noisy sample that he, uh, you know, we only have 16 and two-thirds on the guys. So, But very early value metrics here on the four-seamer splitter slider mix is super equitable for him, and I think he could pick through this lineup um, with pretty high upside and, and decent regularity. So if you land on a Logan Allen in the mid-range. I think this is an okay tournament play as well. Um, not my favorite to go out of my way and, and you know, smash him in, but uh, I think this is fine. He's got upside for 25 in this in this spot. Um, even going after a, a really good lineup against lefties over here, I mean, Anthony Rendon in the middle has really solidified them uh, and made it very difficult to get through. So perhaps concerned a little bit with the strikeout upside. Uh in in totality here for Logan Allen, um, you know, in his last outing, probably just didn't have it against the Twins. He only struck out three, but in his first two against Miami and Boston, struck out eight in in both of those starts. So, um, you know, he's he can go a full six and and strike out a K plus an inning here. Uh, I think this is an in, intriguing spot for him. Uh, at 7,800, very low ownership. I think it, you could probably land on this. But once again, we, we're going to have run support issues for Logan Allen as well because Cleveland's not going to be able to score just because they never score. Um, so if I had to choose, I'd side with just pitching here. Ugh, it's kind of a wash due to the matchup um, and the, the price delta here between Tyler Anderson and, and Logan Allen. But um, I think I'd probably prefer just playing Tyler Anderson and not watching the baseball game. But uh, I really like the upside of Logan Allen. I think both arms are in play here on the mound. Um, and really not so much the offenses. If you want to play an off-the-board Angels stack, yeah, go ahead, because they're very good against left-handed pitching. Uh, and targeting a, a, a young arm is always okay. Um, but really not my favorite. I think I'd side with pitching there. Let's move on. St. Louis and Boston. We're not going to side with pitching here at all. Uh, we have Adam Wainwright on the mound making his second start of the season. Um, there's just no upside in this particular spot. Boston has been fantastic against lefties all season. And that, even though they got picked apart by Charlie Morton in their last outing, um, or at least in the last one that I can remember, uh, they're still fantastic in aggregate. 120 WRC plus, 19% strikeout rate. They do hit for power. 195 ISO and a 31.5% hard contact rate with 352 WOBA. They're going to get the baseball on a line in the in the air here, and they're going to be very difficult to go after. Uh, Wayno is just a sinker cutter change guy, but um, you know, and we're not like super worried about the arsenal or anything. But moving a little bit more usage over to the curveball in his latter starts of last season and the first start of this year, so um, throwing this a little bit more similar to like Charlie Morton, just relying on on the good pitches he, he trusts in, but still throwing uh, a vulnerable two-seamer here against the against both sides of the plate. So we got to be careful of that. He'll, he'll use the cutter a little bit more against lefties, but um, break-even values for him here on, on those two pitches in the fastball arsenal. So 
It's a it's a very dangerous spot. We're not going to be playing Wainwright. Uh, 7,400 is a nice price tag, but this is a horrible, horrible matchup. Uh, James Paxton is actually making his season debut for the Red Sox today. He hasn't thrown in the big leagues in two years. So uh, I think we can, first off, cross him off immediately. Um, 77, or he, he should be 5,700 here, uh, given the amount of injuries that he's gone through and the total unknowns. Um, now, this season... He's debuting late because he's had a hamstring strain. But over the last couple of years, he's had like TJ, he's had shoulder injuries, forearm strains, like you name it. Um, he's hurt all the time here. And this is also a horrible matchup uh, against Cardinals. Cardinals very good, 116 against lefties, WRC plus, 21% aggregate K rate, 36% hard contact. Hitting for just a 160 ISO, but this is going to come up if this hard contact number persists as we as I've mentioned over the last couple of weeks now. Um, so I'm not going near any pitching in this game. Uh, it's offense only, and we're not really fooling anybody. Both St. Louis and Boston going to top and in, in top pop rather in top five uh, in value and in ownership here uh, on, on the full slate today. So uh, you can make, you can get different with them because there's some other teams, San Francisco, Philly, um, that are also going to be popular. Texas we'll get to. So you can get different with these guys for sure um, and attack. I, I really like offense in this game. It uh, should be warm. It's 80 degrees in, in Boston now, and we're not dealing with the 50-degree weather at night. So um, Fenway should play up some offense pretty good tonight. Okay, let's move on. Kansas City and Milwaukee. Uh, Josh Taylor on the mound. He's another one of the openers. He's just going to open, only going to go about an inning here. Kansas City's bullpen has been, like, who knows who they're going to bring in afterward. Um their bullpen has been respectable this season, about average uh, relative to everybody else on the slate. So generally, does that mean I want to go? I don't like stacking teams in bullpen games. It's just it, it makes it difficult on the hitters to really get any consistency. And when you're only seeing like you're seeing a different arm every plate appearance, uh, it decreases your ability to find that consistency. Right. So um I am not going to take any stock in in the Brewers' numbers against lefties uh, in this particular matchup because who knows who they're going to bring in. They're definitely going to see some righties out of the bullpen tonight. So, And Taylor's only going to, going to go an inning. Uh, so I don't really care what these numbers say here. Um, they're a little bit better against right-handers. I mean, they're markedly better against right-handers. You see here 350 PAs against lefties, 63 WRC+, plus in aggregate about 1,000 more PAs against righties, and an aggregate 92 WRC plus. So the, the WRC plus against righties is pushing 100 and, and even over. Um, so they're markedly better against the right side than they are uh, against the lefties. So I don't really care uh, either way. They're kind of an off the board stack here a little bit as well, uh, but really popping super hard in value, but not so much in ownership so far. Um, We'll have to keep an eye on that. But uh, if you want to play some correlated Corbin Burns teams with them, yeah, go ahead. 9,200 on the mound for him. Heavy, heavy ownership coming in so far, but this is a Royals. I mean, like, whatever. We like targeting them with right-handers, of course, because they, they've been awful. Uh, 82 WRC+, plus, 24% K rate, 150 ISO, and a 293 Woba. Uh, let's do it. They do make some hard contact, so if you want to get to a couple of sort of uh, leverage stacks, or leverage singleton pieces from the Royals. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you can always play Vinny. That's, of course, perfectly fine. Um, he is a, a still playable 3,800. Salvi at 44. He's probably going to have some chase rate issues in this particular matchup. Corbin Burns has a good bit of chase with the curveball and slider mix. Um, and this cutter, when he's got it moving, man, it, it cuts a hell of a lot. So... Uh, it could be a kind of a dangerous spot for Salvi here today, but he's playable at 4,400. If you want to get there, I'd almost rather get to MJ uh, at 3,700, but I'm not super thrilled about that. Bobby Witt at 51, probably not. So yeah, I think it would just be a short, maybe a Nick Prado, 2,800, that's playable, uh, or a Vinny at 38, as I mentioned. If you want to get off of some of the, or leverage some of the Corbin Burns here, probably just deep tournament stuff. I don't think you'll need to do that in like 20 max, but he'll be very popular pretty much across the board, single entry, 20 max, all this kind of stuff. So uh, if you want to try and find some leverage, those would be the, the couple of guys I, I'd look to. Uh, 9,200 on the though on the mound for him, um, yeah, I think he's underpriced. 
uh, for his relative upside. Got a 29% aggregate K rate. Little bit of susceptibility in throwing strike one, which can elevate his pitch count a little bit sometimes. Um, but overall, Cutter has been fantastic this season. Slider and curveball have also been pretty good as well. So no problems here with playing a 9,200 Corbin Burns on the mound. Um, and everything is great. So, yeah, like go after it. It's just uh, eating the ownership. Um, if you want to play some very off the board, as of right now, Milwaukee Stacks, um, yeah, make it happen. You can play every one of them. Like I said, they're going to see a lot of righties here. It's tough because it's a mediocre offense in a bullpen game, but uh, I think it's it's perfectly playable, and, and they're, they're popping really hard in, in value score so far. Uh, okay, Houston and the White Sox. J.P. France in the mound. Ugh, I was really looking forward to playing him again. Um, he was very impressive in his first outing against uh, Seattle, I believe. And he loaded the bases in the first inning, which was not good. But he got out of it just fine without giving up any production. He ended up lasting five innings and striking out five. Um, so making his, I guess his debut, his seasonal debut uh, against Seattle, perhaps a couple of nerves in the early going, just gave up, um, you know, some base hits in the, in the early, he didn't walk anybody is, is kind of the point I'm making. So, um, it's unfortunate. However, his price jumped to 7,600 cause I kind of wanted to play him in this spot. I don't think this is totally off the board at 76. Like I said, in the, in this mid range here, we're really kind of starving for guys that we're thrilled playing. I mean, you're not playing Paxton, you're not playing Wayno. Um, who else? You're not, like, you're not going to play Kopech on the other side against Houston. We'll get to that in a sec. So, like, up there with Logan Allen, right? Sure. I mean, it's an okay matchup because White Sox, the White Sox just stink, man. They are so bad. But they are probably getting Yoan Moncada back tonight, which should help their uh, should help their production immensely, really from both sides of the plate, as he is a switch hitter. So... That'll make it a little bit more difficult on opposing starters. Uh, and, of course, they've got Tim Anderson back healthy and Andrew Benintendi doesn't strike out a lot at the top of the lineup. Um, so they're they're still missing Aloy, of course, in the middle, who's probably, I mean, right there with Tim Anderson, their best raw hitter. But uh, I think this is still an attackable lineup if you land on a JP France or something and run like correlated Astros teams. I think this is perfectly fine still. I don't like the price tag. I'd much rather that he were a bit cheaper. I'd be much more excited about this. But this is still playable here, and I think you might be able to eke out six innings here. Unfortunately, if he can only go about five, uh, then you're probably looking for maybe a 20-point ceiling, somewhere around there, uh, which is probably a, a little difficult to stretch. Uh, on a full 13 game slate, you might need a little bit more out of that or out of your arms on the mound tonight. But it's it's playable for sure. Um, Kopech on the mound, we're not going to play this. I, I mean, I'm not. 7,500, even though he had one good start two starts ago uh, against, I believe, Minnesota, where he went six, struck out like seven or something. I mean, there's just so much variance with Kopech because his four seamer is bad and his slider is bad, right? So he, he still didn't have a changeup, so it makes him very susceptible to left handers. Still gives up power there, even though he's got a little bit of swing and miss with the curveball. Um, but the slider has been pretty dreadful this season, and that's making him a lot more susceptible to the right side, right? Throwing, like, nothing has really changed as far as usage here. Um, he's actually increased the usage of the changeup up to about 5% now, and it's still bad, right? So he's, still, he's yielding a full out to the field. On the four-seamer, change-up, he's yielding about three-quarters of an out. Slider has been getting absolutely blasted. He's losing three-and-a-half outs to the field now. And the curveball is just really no change here. It's been about break-even. So uh, there's not a good pitch here in the arsenal. He still has walk problems to the left side of the plate. He still has strike one problems. He has pitch count problems. Um, and he has barrel and and hard contact problem. So like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Um, I would much rather just get to the Astros and unfortunately they're not going to be activating Michael Brantley. Uh, he appears to have, uh, experienced a little bit of a setback in his rehab. So, um, we're still dealing with, uh, everybody that we dealt with before Pena still expensive 47, not my favorite here, but it's a high upside spot for him for sure. 
because Kopech only has a 15% K rate to the right side of the plate, and that's really Jeremy Pena's problem. Uh, Alex Bregman is in a really good spot here, 4,600. He was popular um, in the last series against uh, against the Angels. Uh, didn't really perform all that well, but I think it's a very high upside spot for him tonight. Jordan Alvarez, of course, you can play him at 6,000. I like this. Josie Abreu still a corpse in the middle unfortunately, but at 29, he is a playable piece in stacks. Kyle Tucker, 53, Jolks, Hensley. If you want to play David Hensley at 21 instead of Josie Abreu at 29, I think that's fine, to be quite honest. Um, not something I would have said like last year, for example. But you can go after some Kopech, and you can really make this happen. Houston is also going to pop a little bit in the value, but not so much in the ownership. There's just only so many teams that we could play here. Uh, but I think this is a very high upside tournament stack. Uh, might have to keep an eye on some weather uh, over here in Chicago tonight. But uh, outside of that, yeah, give me all of Houston and really none of the White Sox. Maybe some Tim Anderson um, at 54 leading off. But that's there are a couple Gavin Sheets pieces at 2,800. But outside of that, I'm really not excited uh, about anything from the Sox. Okay, Cubs and the Twins, 9,100 on the mound for Smiley. I'm still looking to short Smiley, and uh, I think we might get the opportunity here today. Uh, I like the Twins here a little bit. Um, we'll get to them in full stacks here in a second, but with Smiley, he is basically moved all of the he's, – he's flattened out a lot of the uh, usage here to sinker cutter, but the fastball mix is, is bad, right? Um, not throwing as much of the curveball. But he's still like heavy, heavy usage on it at uh, you know 45 percent or 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 so. Um, I mean, it's, it's dropped off a little bit and it's varied from start to start as it kind of does. Um, throwing this sinker up to what 42, 45 percent, uh, give or take, and he's kind of have the cutter usage. Um, so that's really how he really the only changes he's made. Uh, this season, it's not like he introduced a new pitch or anything necessarily, but uh, he has been good um, and suppressed contact and suppressed production. The price tag, however, is kind of out of control now at 9,100. Now, that said, uh, the Twins have been horrific against left-handed pitching in their 275 PA sample so far um, this season. 28% K rate, it's kind of out of control. 79 WRC plus, 31% hard contact, 283 Woba. So all of these numbers are going to tell you to stay the hell away, um, at least from a batted ball perspective from the Twins. However, I like the pricing on them today. And like I said, I'm still looking to uh, take some shorts on Drew Smiley. I think the price tag on him has gotten a little carried away to the upside. Um, let's see, for the Twins here, we've got a playable 5,600 on Byron Buxton. think it's okay. Uh, even though he's been awful, he's only hitting like 220 with like an 800 OPS. Pretty bad. Um, Georgie Polanco's back. He's been fine. 4,600. Price came down, coming down a little bit. And that's playable piece. 43 for Carlos Correa. Now is where I really start to get intrigued here. Kyle Farmer is back off the off the DL. Hit a bomb the other day. Uh, 3,100 for him. Donnie Solano, not a lot of upside from him, but he's 2,200. Unfortunately, you got to play him at first base if you do so. Both catchers behind the plate, uh, Christian Vasquez, 25, Ryan Jeffers, uh, 3,000, I believe. Michael Taylor down at the bottom, 2,300, is also very cheap and very playable. So they make stomaching what is, at, at least at the moment, 5,600 on a Byron Buxton um, a little bit easier. That said, uh, I think we can still get to the Twins and and play, take some, some shorts on Drew Smiley, uh, I'm not overly convinced here because the value on this fastball mix for him is is really leaving a lot on the table here. Um, you know, the the cutter has been good, but like I said, he's had the usage. He's only thrown only about seven eight percent now, um, and and the curveball has has been equitable for him. But the the sinker value is basically break even still, so he's got a pretty suspect mix here. Um, and he's really kind of relying just on, on two equitable pitches, but he's not throwing this cutter enough. So uh, I think that makes him attackable, and the sinker is still overall, uh, it's a break-even pitch for him, and it's a bad pitch against the opposite side of the plate. So, um, or opposing, uh, opposite-handed hitters, let me say it that way. Uh, so I think we can play some of the twins here. 
Uh, I'd much rather just get to them because I, I don't like the price tag on Smiley. Sonny Gray on the mound for Minnesota. 10,000, yeah, I want to get to this. Uh, he's been absolutely incredible this season. He has flattened out uh, all of the usage here. He's throwing more of the cutter. He's throwing more of the changeup. And every single one of the pitches has been good, including the sinker. He's he can value top to bottom out of a full six pitch mix here, and th- like he's just been amazing. Um, and, and I I want to play this today. Ten thousand I think is a very playable spot against the Cubs. I know they've been very good against right handed pitching. They have how however cooled off quite a bit in the last couple of weeks. One hundred nine WRC plus in aggregate, twenty one percent K rate, three thirty three WOBA. It's all fine. They're leaving a little bit on the table, though, in the hard contact and a little bit on the table in the soft contact. So hitting a, a few too many ground balls for my liking. They're a lo- on the line a little bit more, but they, they're missing their leadoff hitter now, Nico Horner, who's got a hammy. So he's likely to be out of the lineup, even though Nick Madrigal, who they'll likely plug in, doesn't strike out himself. Uh, he's not Nico Horner. He's not nearly the the upside hitter that, uh, that Nico is. So... Um, Strikeout wise, I think this is a, a fine upside spot for Sonny Gray because he has six pitches and he's getting value out of every single one of them. This is going to make it super difficult on the Cubs here. And like I said, they are regressing and coming back to earth here a little bit. And overall, this pretty average baseball team, um, it, even though they've had a, a pretty good start to the season so far. So uh, I think you got to lay about a dollar fifty or so. You know, lay three to two on on the Twins. Uh, into betting markets. It seems like an okay play uh, this evening. I'd really like to get to some Sonny Gray, and he's going to come in at half the ownership to both Strider and Garrett Cole. So, yeah, sign me up. Really no Cubs for me. Um, I don't really want to go out of my way to target Sonny. I love the pitch mix, and I love the value on it. So, uh, yeah, sign me up. Okay, let's get to Coors Field, Philly, and Colorado. 6,700 on the mound for Taiwan Walker. I'm not going to be doing this. Uh, 21% aggregate K rate. Colorado Rockies offense has really been heating up. Um, now, that doesn't mean I'm really stoked about playing them. I, I respect Taiwan Walker here, and I do kind of like this price tag. Don't get me wrong. But he just doesn't have the raw whiff stuff that really gets me excited when I'm playing pitchers against Rockies at Coors Field. Um, so I'd like to – I'm really intrigued by the splitter value. He's still eking a lot of um, – a lot of plus value out of this particular pitch, and that'll keep him down in the strike zone a little bit at Coors Field, which is definitely what you want to do. But his slider has really not been good this season. And throwing it, uh, he's dropped the usage, which is nice, down to about 12%, uh, and have the uses on the breaking stuff in the in the curveball. So that'll keep him uh, a little bit more playable, so to speak, from a, a real-life uh, pitch pick standpoint at Coors Field, uh, but the value on those two pitches, the slider and the curveball, still throwing them at a 17-18% aggregate clip here has been totally dreadful, yielding about two and a half outs to the field in aggregate on those two pitches. So the splitter has been very good, but not yielding near as much value as it has in the aggregate sample. Just about a half an out uh, on the plus side here for the split. Same thing with the sinker. Um, he has increased the usage of the sinker up to, uh, what is it, about 20% or so, 22%. Um, so he's, he's also flattening out the fastball usage, dropped down from this 28, 30% of the four-seamer, added more of the sinker. Um, so that'll keep him a little bit more down in the strike zone. That's why we see the spike in the ground ball numbers, up to a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball against righties, buck 30 against lefties. Uh, that said, this is still... Coors Field and a guy without a breaking pitch arsenal, um, I'm not super intrigued with because the four-seamer value is still terrible. It's still giving up a full two outs to the field. Um, so really not interested in that uh, at all, uh, even at a, an attractive price tag, 6700 I'd like to get to some of the Rockies if I can because nobody's going to play them, and it's still the Rockies at Coors Field. And like I said, their offense is really heating up. I don't want to play Austin Gomber, however. He's a total non-starter at 5,200. Um, even though he has suppressed a little bit in a couple of his more recent starts, uh, you're not doing this against Philly at Coors Field. It's just not happening. Um, so Philly's going to come in as not, I mean, kind of surprisingly, not the most popular team, at least so far. 
It's because they're pricing. DK has finally jacked up the prices of opposing teams at Coors Field. 58 for Schwarber, Turner, and Harper each. 52 for Castellanos, 54 for JTR. The playable price tags are down at the bottom of the lineup. Alec Bohm, Josh Harrison, uh, Edmundo Sosa, and we'll see what they do for the last piece here. Maybe a Dalton Guthrie or something um, from the right side. But they can go heavy, heavy, heavy from the right side here, and I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. With Austin Gomber, three, uh, 296 average allowed, 372 WOBA, 228 ISO, 17% K rate, one and a half, 1.7 homers per nine uh, at Coors Field. No, thank you. So offense only, mostly the Phillies here. But you can play some off the board Rocky stacks if you want. You can go after Taiwan Walker. Nobody's going to be playing these guys. They're expensive, but uh, you know this is Coors Field doesn't matter. Okay, Texas and Oakland. Uh, we're going to see a lot of ownership here on Texas tonight, as we probably should. Ken Waldachuk has some real serious problems with right-handers still, uh, and nothing has really changed, even though he's had a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe a couple encouraging starts here. Um, he still just doesn't have a, a good change-up or a good fastball, and bad fastball, bad change are going to make him really vulnerable to the right side of the plate. And sure enough, 300 average allowed, 412 Woba, 296 ISO, 20% K rate, 2.6 homers per nine to righties. Uh, in this full 70 and two-thirds aggregate sample, 56 and a third to the right side. That's, that's a huge sample um, for those kinds of numbers. These are real, real bad figures. Hot, a lot of fly balls here, a lot of line drives as well to both sides of the plate. So you can't go near Waldachuk. Uh, on the mound, even though he's popping in projection and ownership here so far, I don't understand this at all. Um, I think Texas, I think this is a real high upside spot for Texas. Um, it's kind of enigmatic today in that you're seeing a ton of ownership on Texas, but also a lot of ownership here on Waldachuk on the other side. This is, I'd much rather side with the offense here and and stay away from Waldachuk at What's well, sure an attractive price tag, but no thank you. Martin Perez on the mound. You're also going to see a little bit of ownership on him. It's come down, though, in the last couple hours. Uh, so I like getting to this now that he's under 15%. He was pushing 20 or so uh, in the early ownership runs. So I, I like to see this trending downwards, probably where he'll hover the rest of the, throughout the rest of the day. 8,300, I think it's fine. Um, Oakland is, a, as we discussed a little bit earlier, better against lefties than they are against righties. So... Uh, 106 WRC plus, about six ticks above average here. 21% K rate. It's a good number, to be quite honest. Not a lot of power, not a lot of hard contact necessarily, but not a lot of soft contact either. So they're in the medium category, pushing 57, 58% here. And they hit the ball on the line at a neutral ground ball to fly ball. So I think they're, yeah, they're just average against lefties. And generally, we don't want to, like, target that. They're, they're kind of sticky. Um, they've got Asteri Ruiz up at the top. Brett Rooker, who's been great, um, and uh, who else? Let's see, Carlos Perez. They had a three-homer day the other day, Jordan, or, or that was Jordan Diaz. Carlos Perez uh, also hit one, I believe, in the in the Yankee series, maybe even two. Shea Langleyers has popped behind the plate from the right side. So they've got some righties they can platoon with here and, and attack Martin Perez. However, I don't particularly care. Martin Perez has a high ground ball rate to both sides of the plate, buck 50, buck 60, and he doesn't give up any power. Induces a lot of soft contact, not so much to the right side. So if you are going to get to a couple of A's, I would go to some guys that make real hard contact. But you're really not getting all that much leverage on it anymore. That, or at least not of the on the 20% ownership that Martin Perez was displaying earlier um, in early ownership runs. So he doesn't give up a lot of hard contact himself, and induces a lot. We're not we're not touching a lefty against him. He's elite against that side. 39 and two-thirds, 272 Wola with an 083 ISO. Like, no thanks. Um, lower strikeout rate, yeah, so he'll pitch to some contact here, but I think this is a fine suppression spot because he's a much better arm than is Oakland, Oakland's lineup in, in aggregate. So um, I think you can play him, and I think it's a fine cash play at 8,300. I, I like this a decent bit. Um, probably going to struggle a little bit because of how few strikeouts uh the the ballpark itself yields just in general but 
and he's not a high strikeout pitcher himself at just 20 percent in aggregate but it's a, it's a fine suppression spot and uh, he's a good arm here I think you could play this in tournaments as well probably not heavy exposures I'm w- not sure I want to get uh, super crazy with more ownership than than 15 percent or so but uh, I think this is playable uh, definitely in in pretty much all formats um like I said, with Oakland, it'd probably just be an Asteri Ruiz or a Brent Rooker, uh, maybe a Jesus Aguilar. you got to play him at first base, though. He's 2,500, which is great, uh, but this is a 13-game slate, and I don't really want to go after Martin Perez. So uh, not my favorites to be getting to Oakland today. I'll probably leave them on the shelf, and they're a, they're a horrible, horrible offense just in general, uh, even though they are a little bit better against lefties. So Texas exclusively here. Give me everybody uh, against Waldachuk. Uh, especially Marcus Semien. I like Ken Walchuk has a terrible fastball and Semien is a fantastic. He's one of the best fastball hitters in baseball. Uh, give me some Robbie Grossman too. If he's in the two hole, uh, very cheap. He's going to pop real hard for us in value metrics today. Nate Lowe, you can play him against righties or lefties. Doesn't matter. He's at 4,100 now. Adelise Garcia, 5,000 flat. I want to play all these guys. Josh Young in particular, his problem is strikeouts and, uh, Ken Waldchuk's not going to throw it past him. So, um, Jonah Heim behind the plate? Yeah, sure. And any of the guys down at the, the bottom of the lineup will make it cheap. Bubba Thompson is an intriguing play here tonight against a lefty. If he can get on base, uh, that's really the problem with Bubba. Um, he's got all the speed in the world, and he could steal a couple of bags for you as well. So, uh, a, lot of, a lot of ways you can... Um, you can really make this happen tonight. Would be careful with some Zeke Durant, with some Zeke Duran. He's got a high chase rate, um, so his plate discipline really isn't the best. But he's cheap at, at 2,800. You can play literally everybody in in the Texas lineup tonight. Doesn't matter who they play. Uh, righties, lefties, uh, yeah, sign me up with the with all of them. Okay, San Francisco, Arizona. I'll try and get through this quickly as well. John Brebby on the mound. He's just going to open here. I don't know what DK is doing with these prices uh, of these openers. I mean, it. it not like we'd ever consider playing an opener anyway, but it's just so goofy. The guy hasn't thrown more than three innings in six years <laughs> in in the in the bigs. Like it's just, it's so crazy. Uh, in any case, 8,400 on the mound for him. We're not doing it. Uh, it looks like it might be Alex Wood. They might bring him after him, and he's actually 7,900. So like, what are we doing? Um, in any case, I've not super thrilled about playing any Alex Wood either uh, against D-backs. Um, against righties, they have a 19% K rate. Against lefties, it's about 19, or it's about 20% K rate. Um, and Alex Wood doesn't have a high strikeout rate himself. I probably should just put him in the list, but, um, you know, so it goes. Um, but who knows what the Giants are going to do. They may bring in somebody before Alex Wood. They may not even activate Alex Wood. I mean, who knows? Uh, they like to play these matchup shenanigans and do all kind of play this gamesmanship garbage. Um, you know, it, it really doesn't increase the upside uh, for them as much as they think. In any case, um, we don't really know what the Giants are going to do after Brebbia. It'll likely be Wood, but uh, I don't really want to play him anyway. 7,900. Um, he's probably only going to go about four or five innings anyway, and that's kind of stiff at that point particular price tag in what's really a, a bad matchup against Arizona. Ryan Nelson on the mound for the um, D-backs, 7,000. You can't play him either. He's only has a 17% strikeout rate, and he has freaking a 56% strike one rate. Like He, he cannot get ahead of hitters here, and that's going to make him very vulnerable with a bad fastball and a change that he doesn't really throw all that much. So um, I don't think we can get to this. 53% now in the fastball, so he's spreading things around a little bit more. 10% of the change, so not much of a of an alteration there. 31% of the slider, so he's really ticked up that usage at a, the expense of a couple of ticks on the curveball. Value-wise, um, you know, fastball is just getting bludgeoned, giving up an out and a half to the field now. Changeup has been good, but like I said, he's only throwing it about 10% of the time. So that's fine. That'll help him neutralize a little bit of production to left-handed hitters here, but he's still not going to throw it past them. And that's really the issue that we run into when playing a lot of San Francisco against right-handers is that they strike out. But here they're going to walk. They're going to be very patient. They're going to put guys on base, and they're going to hit for a boatload of power in this particular matchup. Uh, I think is a very good spot for the Giants, and we're not fooling anybody. They're one of the other teams. Actually, they are coming in as the most popular 
uh, with Texas right behind them right now. So you might even get Philly under under owned here today. Like who knows? So uh, you can go after Ryan Nelson definitely at seven thousand. I think he's just flat overpriced. Um, for these kinds of metrics. I don't like anything about the Arsenal uh, with a bad fastball. Yeah, fine, good changeup mix, and he'll neutralize some power to lefties. But, I mean, they still have they have Jock over here. They have Conforto at 3,100. Um, they have Lamont Wade leading off 36. Tyro hits right, he's just fine. J.D. Davis hits right, he's just fine. Hanniger hits right, he's just fine. Crawford's probably going to be back, 3,100 for him. Um, and they have a Blake Sable or Joey Bart behind the plate that they can they could do some things there if they want also. Now, so there should be some offense here tonight, I think, um, targeting some Alex Wood, likely Alex Wood, uh, for the D-backs, and targeting uh, Ryan Nelson for the Giants. Uh, I'd like to get as much exposure to these guys as I can, but their pricing is going to make them very popular. So that's really the only thing we got to worry about there. Okay, last game of the day here, San Diego and the Dodgers. Now, okay, I, I love counter-trading the market here with Blake Snell. I love it. There's so much upside for the guy if he can throw strikes. Uh, and this is a good matchup against the Dodgers. Now, this is a very potent offense. Don't get me wrong. Uh, good. It's a good strikeout matchup. Let me be clear. It is a horrible walk matchup. And this is why I don't want to play Blake Snell, even though at 8,100, I think he, I think it's reasonable that he could last a five or even six innings here tonight and, and strike out seven or eight. Um, I think it's very possible, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull the trigger in anything but super deep tournament teams. I'll have a little bit of exposure because I love doing this when he's completely off the board. I, I do not play him when he's, when he's popular at all. Uh, I just X the guy, and a lot of the time, uh, you know, I'm on the right side there. So I love doing the exact opposite when nobody is interested because he's in a bad matchup or or just or whatever. Um, then yeah, we can we can go to him because he still has 30% chase and a 30% K rate. Um, it's just the walks and making it super difficult on himself against very patient teams. And that's really what takes me off of him in this particular matchup. I think the price tag is fine here. You know, we're not not paying 9K for him or whatever. Um, I think that's fine to approach this at, at 8,100 because we're kind of starving for a little bit of value. He's, he's getting them again. He saw them in his last start, and he went a full six innings, still walked three, but struck out six. So the upside for him to strike out guys and maintain a little bit of a floor here is there. Um, however, this is super high variance. He could walk six people and be out in three and a third, uh, and give up four runs. So very high variance spot, um, deep tournament stuff only. I think, I don't think you could even get to this in like 20 max or anything. I, it's just so much variance in this particular spot because he could very well just go five innings, have an average outing and you're kind of boned at 8,100. Um, so not my favorite going after the Dodgers. I usually don't like doing this. Um, and sure, if you want to stack some of the Dodgers on the other side and target this very high walk rate and high variance, yeah, go ahead. This is still one of the best offenses in baseball, despite the fact that they, I mean, they've lost 15 games mostly because of their pitching staff. It's not their offense that's good. That's bad. So, um, yeah, give me some of the Dodgers, but also a little bit of Blake Snell here. I think there's upside for him to survive. I did mention that it's back-to-back -back starts for him against the Dodgers, and I usually side with the offense in that in those scenarios, and I probably would here as well. Um, this team in particular is just so, so patient that uh, it's going to make it difficult on Blake Snell. He, he nibbles a lot against bad teams, and when he starts to do it against good teams, that's really uh, a bad recipe. But um, at very low ownership here, there's upside for him at this price tag. Uh, okay, Dustin May on the other side, 8,500. Ugh. Um, not so much upside for him in this particular matchup. 25.5% K rate is nice that the dot or that the uh, Padres exhibit against righties, right? 92 WRC plus, like pretty average, mostly everywhere. That makes him hard contact. Yeah, whatever. Um, and now that like Tatis is back, Soto is starting to heat up finally. Uh, I think this is kind of a dangerous spot for him. I love this stuff in general. He pops really hard in, in plus metrics. Um, 
in location, in stuff, and in, in the pitching plus metric, of course, from Eno Saras. Uh, all of this stuff. He, he pops really, really hard. Um, so I, I love the arsenal in general. I don't like the fact that he just doesn't have any whiffs. And, and that really kind of takes me off the board here. It takes him off the board for me at 8,500. Um, he's fine in tournaments because nobody's going to play the guy. Uh, he, he has 25 point upside here, um, for sure. So if you want to, if you want to land on this, um, I would go out of my way to target it. Cause I don't like going after the Depadres, but he popped in this very same matchup literally five days ago, six days ago, went six innings, struck out six, right? Didn't give up any production whatsoever. Just walked one. So, uh, once again, I would side with the offense. Uh, but it's very reasonable that you see a, another pitcher's sort of duel here where both starters go six innings and strike out some guys. Uh, it's very possible. Padres have been bad and well below average uh, against righties this season, and Dustin May is an above-average righty with way above-average stuff. So that makes him very playable. He's got some walk problems uh, later on in the count, but uh, the the price tag would mostly keep me off here. But uh, if I land on some Dustin May teams, I'm not going to X him. I think this is okay at very, very low ownership here. Nobody's going to play this guy. Uh, and, and they really never do because he, he has underwhelming strikeout stuff. But uh, I think it's okay to target um, target this type of spot. If you want to play some correlated Dustin May and Dodgers teams, literally zero people in all of DFS on DK are going to have that tonight. So... Uh, I think that's a, a reasonable construction if you want to play some deep tournament teams with the Dodgers in May and hope Snell just has a blow-up game. Uh, I think it's fine. So pitching is intriguing here tonight, I think. Uh, I'm less on the Padres. I don't like going after Dustin May. He's super hard to, to get after um, with a freaking 99-mile-an-hour sinker. Uh, he throws a four-seamer hard, too, stays down with the cutter and the slide. I mean, just all of it is just fantastic. Um, so... He's similar to a Sunny Gray and just super hard to attack. Um, so mostly the Dodgers, a little bit of Snell, though. Um, if you want to play a Juan Soto, I mean, he's 5,000 now. Like I said, he's heating up. You can play Tatis every day against every, everybody. It doesn't matter. Uh, everybody else I'm kind of meh on. But um, you want to make like a three-man 2,800 Matt Carpenter? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, that's it for the breakdown. Um, let's quickly go over stacks and see if we can get out of here. Give me some Yankees a little bit uh, against Tampa. Who knows what they're going to do. If it's Josh Fleming coming in for sure, um, then, yeah, I think the, the Yankees have a good bit of upside. Probably no Tampa, but Garrett Cole's going to be pretty popular here at 30%. If you want to take some Tampa team, this is the best team in baseball. So uh, go ahead. Um, I think that's perfectly fine, even without Wander Franco. Mets and Washington, I'm kind of off of the Mets. A couple of the price tags there are starting to get attractive, but not so much. If it is Tyler McGill, um, I think you play some some left-handed pieces from Washington over here, Luis Garcia in particular, um, maybe like a cheap stack with C.J. Abrams or something I think I mentioned uh, down at the bottom of the lineup. Overall, mostly pitching here. I do like Gore a little bit. I don't like the matchup or the price tag necessarily, but uh, it's fine to land on in tournaments if you get there. Pittsburgh and Baltimore, sneaky offense here in this game, I think. Baltimore for sure uh, against Yohan Oviedo. His, the value on his pitch mix has dropped off a cliff here, uh, and I think I want to attack that. Kyle Bradish, maybe if you land on him because Pittsburgh has been so cold. But uh, I think you can get to a couple of Pittsburgh teams if you want to as well. Super off the board stacks are Baltimore and the Pirates. Uh, Atlanta and Toronto, I don't want pretty much any offense in this game, I think. If anything, it'd be it'd be Atlanta. But, uh, yeah, give me a lot of Strider. I think it's a really, really good matchup for him, to be quite honest. Uh, even against a, a generally low strikeout team in Toronto, um, I'd much rather play Strider tonight than Cole, I think. Um, if I had to choose angels and Cleveland, uh, sneaky pitching matchup here as well. Not super intrigued with offense. I'd never play Cleveland. Uh, never like to play Cleveland. That is, um, and I'm not jacked about playing the angels tonight, even though they get a young arm. I, I respect Logan Allen over here. If you land on him in tournaments, I think this is okay. 5,500 for Tyler Anderson is, is pretty attractive to be quite honest. Uh, St. Louis and Boston, uh, offense only here. I'm not dealing with any of the pitchers. Um, we we got to wait and see what Paxton's going to be like. He's got a 16% walk rate in the upper minors in his in his rehab starts. No, thank you. I don't care if he is striking out 26%. Um, this is the Cardinals. No, thanks. So offense only. 
both sides. Uh, Casey and Milwaukee, I think we can get to the Brewers tonight. In early runs, they're coming in completely off the board, but very high value stack. So there's some upside here. Casey bullpen has been good and about average relative to everybody else on the slate, but uh, they're still attackable. Um, short Casey pieces if you want to go after some leverage stacks on Corbin Burns, but give me a lot of Corbin Burns too. Houston almost exclusively here. No Kopech whatsoever. Probably none of the White Sox. Uh, they just stink. And I like some JP France a little bit. If you land on this, I think it's a fine tournament uh, correlated stack as well. Cubs, I'm off. I, I love Sonny Gray here. I'm off of Drew Smiley because of the price tag. And I like Minnesota a little bit here, even though they've been dreadful against left-handed pitching. I'm fully prepared to play Minnesota tonight and smash my head in the door. Um, Philly and Colorado, you might get Philly, as I mentioned, a uh, little bit under-owned here. And I don't know, they get Austin Gomber at Coors Field? Like, yeah, sign me up, man. Uh, and Colorado on the other side, like I said, their offense been heating up. And they get Taiwan Walker with a really good split but not much else in the rest of the arsenal to really um, pick apart and what's really a, a bad offense and undisciplined. But they're playing, they're back at home playing Coors Field, and they're seeing the baseball a little bit. So you can get to both sides here. Uh, no pitching, of course. Texas, Oakland, almost exclusively just Texas. Maybe a couple um, Oakland pieces, but we're not getting the same sort of leverage as we were on Martin Perez earlier. So I like that mostly. Uh, just per, just Martin Perez and, and Texas. San Francisco and Arizona, offense only here. Can't play either of these guys. Um, mostly San Francisco because of their pricing, but you know, we're not fooling anybody. Field is there as well. San Diego and the Dodgers, we just talked about that. Snell a little bit against the Dodgers because they are striking out a, a pant load against um, left-handed pitching this year. High variance spot, though. Dustin May a little bit as well. Uh, the Padres striking out a good bit, too. Dodgers stacks, yeah, if you want to go after Blake Snell, because he walks people. Uh, okay, so that's it. Uh, once again, keep an eye out for projections, updates. We will push them all throughout the day. A uh, lot of data here with a full 13 gamer. So keep an eye out. Um, you don't have to eat a lot of chalk today, can you? Yeah, sure, because there's some really good spots, and they're warranted, the chalk is. Um, but keep an eye out. You can make some interesting tournament pivots, as you really always can on huge slates like this. You can make some sort of mid-range, interesting pitching decisions landing on a J.P. France or um, or something or like a Blake Snell, uh, Logan Allen, Tyler Anderson in this game. You can make some, some gulpy moves here, and you might be able to get away with it tonight. So uh, that's it. Good luck, everybody, on this huge Friday slate.